and welcome to As It Comes, life from a musician's point of view. I'm Davina, I'm a freelance cellist based in London, and I had a gig the other day. What? It's no surprise, gigs have been sparse this summer in the UK, compared to previous years. Remember last year, when I was very late for a wedding? I had to go into stealth mode when I arrived after the bride? having gotten changed in my car and extracted a rogue piece of cheese from my shoes. If you've got no idea what I'm talking about, go back and listen to episode two. In absence of those problems, I was very kindly booked to play for a COVID-secure wedding. The rules at the time were no more than 30 people in attendance, including the celebrants and musicians. I have a feeling this rule has changed now, or is in the process of changing. I don't know anymore. Who can keep up? Anyway, my duet partner and I weren't even allowed in the same room as the ceremony. We were tucked around the corner in a thoroughfare between the kitchen and the ordering till. So I had no idea where the bride was coming from or when she'd arrive at the altar. I asked a staff member to let me know when she was coming and, crucially, to let me know when to stop playing once she'd arrived at the front. He agreed enthusiastically. Oh, yeah, 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 sure, sure. What happened next was that he gave me the signal to start playing. She's coming. But then he left. My head was rotating from side to side like a mad lighthouse as I mouthed, Where's he going? Come back. Like Rose at the end of Titanic. Then I thought I'd sneak a peek into the ceremony room to see what was going on. Have you ever tried to do this while playing the cello? Half squatting, crouched over, end pin still anchored to the same spot on the floor, I didn't get very far. It was about then that one of the guests emerged solemnly from around the corner, brandishing his hand at his neck, doing a cutthroat gesture, as I stood there, mid-squat, in the middle of the hallway, still playing, somehow. We then proceeded to fade to an end. Similar thing happened during the signing of the register, for which typically you'd prepare three songs or a long, slow Packle Bells canon. Because usually they do the legal signing, the photographer takes official photos, and then all the guests spring up to take photos of the couple to put on Instagram. Hashtag blessed. But now it's discouraged to have guests crowding around the couple. So we only got through half a song. This time, the celebrant emerged solemnly from around the corner, doing the cutthroat gesture. Our work was done. We didn't even play for the recessional, again to reduce the risk of crowding people. While it was very quick and easy, and I'm very grateful to have done it, it was strange. I think back to my wedding at the end of 2017, and while our wedding wasn't huge, around 70 people, I couldn't imagine not having everyone there family and friends flying in from overseas, crowding round together for a spot at Chamberoke. If this doesn't make any sense to you, again, go back and listen to episode two where I explain what that is. But with everything, we're getting used to these new normals, to borrow a highly original phrase. So I'm happy to ring in the return of wedding gigs, but it's going to take some getting used to. My guest this episode is Lucia Devanzo Lewis. She's a violinist, violist, she's learning the mandolin, and is also the author of the Eco Notes blog. She provides her insights on living a low waste lifestyle from a musician's perspective, as well as sharing what she's been up to during the year. This was a very special chat because it was face to face, albeit at a distance. My first interview as such in many months, as I've done so many via Zoom. While I'm grateful that that option exists, there's nothing like talking to a friend who's in the same room as you. Have a listen to my chat with Lucia. I don't know about you, but I've invested in a lot more tech since lockdown. I haven't invested in tech, but I have used what's available for free a lot more. Oh, that's lucky. Yeah. Probably should have invested in a couple more things. We did discuss maybe buying a better microphone and that sort of thing. Mm. And we definitely had our sound recorder out a bit more often. Yeah. Just trying to work out how to use it best. 
Mm. and whether our phones are better than this old recorder or not. (laughs) Yeah, it's a slippery slope though, because I think with microphones, you buy one and then you realise you need all this related paraphernalia. Or the better one is out in two months or something. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Like I started off before lockdown, I think, with two microphones and now I have about six. Okay. (laughs) So (laughs) that's just that's just what happens. Yeah. I thought I'd kick things off officially. Lucia, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. And welcome to my flat. And I'm very, very pleased to have you here face to face, ringing in this return to recording podcast episodes face to face because obviously as you know we've had a five month absence from that the last time I recorded a podcast guest was the day after the pandemic was announced back in March cast your mind back how did you react to that news I feel like maybe I believed it was going to happen a bit more than some other people because I have two sisters and a sister-in-law in Italy and they were kind of two weeks ahead of us Mm -hmm. so I'd already heard from them about schools closing and things like that. Uh, I remember my last gig, which might have been something like the 13th of March, driving home from Windsor with my husband. He's also a freelance musician. I think it was like 11 o'clock at night. And just talking in the car about how empty our freezer was. (laughs) And maybe we should go home via Tesco, (laughs) which we did. Did you do the stockpiling? We got what we needed. That's good. Yeah. That's good. You didn't go overboard like... A lot of other people did. We didn't. Well, we were very fortunate that certain things that weren't there that we needed, there was like a slightly different alternative. So we ended up with like sausage meat instead of sausages, that sort of thing, you know. Yeah, yeah. And there was one pack of tissues left on the shelf. Really? And we had just run out. So Okay. That's (laughs) that's very, very lucky. Yeah. (laughs) I mean, I think I probably fell into that camp of people that didn't really realise how serious it was until it happened. Mm. Maybe I wasn't paying enough attention to the news or didn't know many people in Italy. But I just remember it being like quite a huge shock and even back then in March being like, Oh, everyone's really overreacting. But actually it yeah. really did kick off, didn't it? I think it was just so hard to comprehend what it would be like because I think the moments during lockdown that it really hit me the most was just thinking, like, no one that we know has been through this before. Mm-hmm. Like, you could get annoyed at companies for dealing with it the wrong way, but they have no blueprint for what to do. <laughs> yeah. But I think one thing that I found quite interesting was how As freelance musicians, it's quite difficult to to pin each other down and find time to do things together. And naturally, when you know everyone's free, you want to just get together and play some chamber music or something. But then it became very apparent that that was not allowed. (laughs) Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I've never played so many trumpet and violin duets in my life. (laughs) Well, yeah, I guess you're lucky like I am. Being in lockdown with another musician, at least you can make music with another person. Lots of people saying, oh, can't you get together on Zoom and do it? But all of these amazing orchestra videos that you see on Facebook, mm. they've taken hours to piece together yep. and no one was playing like with the other people. Yeah. It's like click track in your ear and off you go. <laughs> oh, I got a bit tired of watching those, to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> there were quite a few of them. <laughs> so um, what else have you been doing during lockdown? I just tried to make the most of it, really. I think we all have experienced the feeling that your to-do list is never going to end. And I just thought... If I don't do some of these things now, I'm never going to do them. Mm -hmm. Things like organising my wedding gig music, you know. (laughs) I've had, I've been building up folders since I was probably about 15. Wow. And it's just such a nice feeling to know that, you know, my solo wedding music is all in alphabetical order. (laughs) It's a good feeling. And my duo music, I'm now working on the trio music. You can see that I'm kind of avoiding the quartet music for now because there's just so much of it. But. Amazing. So when weddings go back and you get your first wedding gig, you'll be first out of the blocks. Well, <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> weddings are, yeah, they will be starting up, I yeah. think. You'll be ready. Yeah. It has been very strange not playing for any weddings this summer. Yeah. And not being able to attend any as well. Mm. I feel so sorry for couples who've had to go through that stress of like trying to guess when... When is a good time to postpone it? Yeah, it goes from postpone to second postponement to, oh, maybe next year or let's not think about it for a while. Yeah. Yeah. I've had 
three weddings I was meant to go to this year. Mm. How about you? Were you meant to go to any? Yeah, we had a couple of friends' weddings and a family wedding as well. So something to look forward to, though. Yeah, because generally weddings tend to get postponed rather than cancelled outright, yeah. you'd hope, but just maybe on a reduced scale. Yes. And so I imagine something that's really been keeping you busy during lockdown would be what we're talking about today, your yes. blog, yes. Eco Notes. So I remember speaking to you about this about a year ago, actually. It was, yes. <laughs> it was about a year ago, and I think we were doing a recording session yes. together, and you were telling me about this blog, Eco Notes, and how it wasn't quite off the ground yet. But now it is. <laughs> now it is. <laughs> so now, I mean, like, honestly, I can definitely relate. It took me a year and a global pandemic to get yes. my website <laughs> up and running. Tell us a little bit about your blog mm-hmm. and the philosophy behind it and what made you want to start it up I had a website before that I'd built when I was at college like a Um, personal artist website yeah just for things like bookings for weddings and orchestral cv teaching advertisement that sort of thing and it was starting to look pretty outdated (laughs) I wasn't very excited about it anymore and I just felt like it needed a big overhaul I'd got married as well so luciadevanzo.co.uk wasn't exactly right anymore. Mm. LuciaDevanzoLewis.co.uk is quite a long web name. It's <laughs> not It's not that snappy. <laughs> yeah, it's a long domain name. Maybe you need to shorten it to like <laughs> D-A-L or something. I know, yeah. <laughs> so there was that. But also I'd started sharing a bit more on Facebook. If I'd seen a really good article about eco-conscious things, it was probably about three or four years before that, that I really started thinking about, you know, how much waste uh, we produce as a society and just in my own home, really. And I just started feeling like I wanted to share that with a few more people. There are so many eco blogs out there. You know, they have a great following, but generally it's people who are already interested in that subject. Mm -hmm. But there's still so many people who wouldn't go looking for a website like that. And I just felt like... I wanted somewhere where I could write about it myself, but also a place where if somebody had come looking for my musical side of the website, they might be a bit curious, you know, Mm. you come to the homepage, there's a picture of a violin, but next to it is a picture of a turtle. (laughs) Why is there a turtle on this violin's (laughs) page? (laughs) Thinking of ways that I could share the changes I'd been making in my life, which actually haven't felt that big there are people out there who are doing massive things for the environment and that's so brilliant but the majority of people they're just going about their daily lives Mm. they can't just you know stop and go and protest all the time or go and campaign for for the environment isn't it that quote that does the rounds quite a lot we don't need people doing everything perfectly but we need a million people doing you can correct me if this is wrong. Yeah. We need a million people doing it imperfectly yeah. or something like that. That quote is actually on my about page on my website. Right. That's probably when um, I last saw it. <laughs> but I haven't, I haven't learned it word for word. But basically, we don't need um, a few people doing things perfectly. We need everyone doing things just a little bit better than they have been doing. Yeah, because I think it's a cumulative, isn't it? Everyone doing their little bit will add up to a greater change. Absolutely. And I'm a firm believer that if you try and change everything all at once, it's going to be a fad that you tire of. Mm-hmm. It's going to become too much for you and you'll just want to go back to how it was before. If you start to change one bit at a time, it's much more manageable. Sometimes I can't remember if I used to do things this way before, you know, and other things are new. So they do feel exciting. You know, there's always something new to be getting used to. It's a big burden to expect yourself to do absolutely everything. There are people who think they're the one person that can change the world. And I think a lot of people have that feeling like, I want to change the world, but it's really difficult as an individual to do so. And I guess it's a little bit like to bring in a music analogy, (laughs) because this is the perspective we're going from. But as one member of an orchestra, you can't produce the sound of an orchestra, but you need your colleagues there. You need everyone playing their part in order to create something. Yeah. I've been doing a project this month on the blog, actually, It's a music project, picking up the mandolin. I did try to play the mandolin several years ago, probably about 10 years ago now. And the instrument had just been gathering dust on the shelf. In a case, okay, so the (laughs) instrument itself wasn't getting dusty. (laughs) But 
yeah, I just felt like it was time to pick it up again. And I'm learning that I need to take it slowly if it's going to stick. And it's exactly the same yeah. with reducing your waste, I think. Just taking it one step at a time, making things feel settled and actually part of your life before you move on to the next step. Yeah, it's baby steps, isn't it? Definitely, You yeah. can't expect it, like for example, you can't be completely zero waste straight away as admirable as that would be yes. but you've got to ease yourself it's like easing yourself into the water when you go swimming in the sea yeah one question i had uh, before we go into tips about what we can do to reduce our waste i wanted to ask you about the mandolin just really quickly yeah. but are the strings the same as the violin so they are so they're tuned in fifths yep and in pairs they are in pairs so right. they call they call that um courses so there are four courses of strings there's a pair of G's, a pair of D's, a pair of A's, and a pair of E's. Sounds delicious. <laughs> so, oh, okay. So tune the same notes as the violin. Yeah. And you have to press down two strings. Yes. Interesting. Yeah. Which is fine on the thinner strings, the E, A, and D. I'm finding it quite tricky to get to grips with on the G because the strings are thicker. A bit thicker. And kind of further away from the middle of my hand. <laughs> yeah. Is that something that surprised you as someone who's obviously very proficient on the violin that you'd have these hurdles? It's surprising me how many things are linked to the violin. I'm writing a blog post on it each week, so saying the things that I've come across that are new and the things that also relate to my violin playing mm. and things like just ending the previous note where you want to start the next one you know making sure your plectrum's on the right string ready I'm always telling my violin students <laughs> finish your slurred notes on the d string with your bow on the a string ready for the next thing or something yeah, like that yeah. you know yeah it's funny to put yourself back into the beginner seat again and I really feel like well hopefully going to help me when I'm teaching as well see things more from their perspective yeah I had someone say to me once that if you're ever struggling to see something from a student's perspective, just try playing your instrument backwards, <laughs> the wrong way around. So hold your bow in your left hand and hold the instrument in your right hand and you'll feel what it's like to feel an instrument for the first time yeah. again. That's a two-set violin trick, isn't it? Is it? They uh, have like challenges in a hat for people to pick out. Hilary Hahn's done some with them. And one of them is to like pick a concerto out of one hat and a challenge out of the other. You've mm -hmm. got to play that concerto. Oh, in that way, yeah. Hands the wrong way around, that sort of thing. <laughs> that must be quite funny because there's that part of your brain that knows what it should be doing and yeah. then that frustration of not actually being able to execute it. Absolutely. Yeah. That's always my argument if people say, you know, left-handed people can never be as good at playing the violin or something as right-handed people. My niece in Italy was told that she really? really wanted to learn the violin, but she ended up playing the French horn, actually, okay. because her teacher said she'd never be as good. Really? Is yeah. that something that people actually say? I feel in like... In some places. <laughs> oh, that's really sad. Because I think being left-handed would bring to you, well, a different approach to your instrument, different Most advantages. Most of the dexterity is in your left hand. Yeah. So, for example, my teacher in Sydney, she was left-handed and she had very, very quick facility with her left hand because it was very easy for her. So, as a result, she had to think extra hard about her right hand. Okay, yeah. And so I think she had really come to grips with everything that was going on in her bow that maybe a right-handed person wouldn't mm. think about as much. So, it just brings a different perspective, Yeah, I think. I think it makes us quite ambidextrous because... How many non-musicians have to think so carefully about what they're doing with their non-dominant hand? Mm. And yeah, it's such a different skill to writing that, yeah. yeah, it's just learning a new skill with a new arm, whether it's your dominant one or not. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I think especially if you learn an instrument from when you're a child, mm. it's a clean slate, isn't it? Absolutely. So it doesn't yeah. matter which hand it is. It's, yeah. it's going to be weird no matter yes. what. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I look forward to hearing updates on your mandolin playing. I will keep sharing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, do. Keep sharing those baby steps. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Not jumping into the deep end too early. But were you tempted to as a violinist? I'm trying to learn from past mistakes because as you'll find out if you read my first mandolin post, I've kind of written out all of the backstory to why I wanted to play the mandolin because a lot of people are like, what? What is that, first of all? And... 
why would you want to play it? Because it can sound quite tinny and when played badly and tuned badly. You can imagine <gasps> if double strings aren't in tune with each other. It's oh, not the greatest sound. Dissonance. Yeah, yeah, of course. But that goes the, with any instrument. Badly tuned does, yeah. and can just sound bad yeah. if played not well. Yeah, but I, I definitely did dive in at the deep end when I tried it about 10 years ago because the opportunity came up to play it in an opera tour that I was doing Mm -hmm. for Don Giovanni one of the arias in that um the main character is singing a love song and there is a mandolin part and we were in a one-to-a-part orchestra so we weren't just going to get a mandolinist in for the tour not even five minutes of music I had been a bit interested in it in the past and I just thought well if I get hold of one you know the strings are the same it's just one piece (laughs) I'll give it a go I got this (laughs) and I did go at it like really hard and I worked hard I did manage to play it in public there is quite a funny video on YouTube taken by the percussionist (laughs) you can just hear me kind of plinky plonking away in the background (laughs) so I had good nights and bad nights but then I just didn't play it for ages and none of it really stuck because I hadn't spent a long time on the basics Mm. yeah yeah and then I think I saw something that you wrote about trying the viola few years ago yes I do actually play the viola oh you do actually play but didn't you jump in to the deep end with that I did but I kept playing okay and although I did jump in at the deep end it was with some kind of structure because I actually just entered myself for grade eight (laughs) (laughs) ambitious as you do um (laughs) the main thing really was um sight reading you have to do your sight reading part of your exam and getting my head around the new clef that was the only thing that I found really hard. Yeah. But it's also the thing that I kind of need the most because probably about 90% of the work I do on viola is playing at weddings with a string quartet. Yeah. And, Sight you know, reading. you don't necessarily have the time to meet and rehearse and know the music inside out. Yeah. There is a lot of sight reading involved with that. <laughs> maybe that's another, that's, maybe that's for next month's blog. You can do a, yes. a viola sight reading <laughs> walkthrough. So as we mentioned before, tips for everyday living and how we can reduce our waste, but also reuse some of the materials that we acquire in our everyday lives and also just acquiring less stuff yeah. as well. So what would be some easy approaches for people who'd be interested in getting into this way of living? Well, my first tip is always the same. I get this question quite a lot and it is just start to be aware of what it is that you're throwing away. We as a society all over the world really we are so concerned with our time with the things we've bought we don't necessarily think about the time before we've bought the item and especially the time after we've bought the item you maybe haven't even thought about the item until you see it in a shop you buy it take it home use it and then if it's not useful to you anymore throw it in the bin you might notice the bin men coming but that's as far as your thought process will go with the item and then you know out of sight out of mind Mm. it's being aware that the time the item has with you is just a tiny bit of that item's lifetime the time it is with you also you should be more mindful of it because we need to look after our stuff better and it will last a lot longer then but yeah definitely if you're thinking about what you're throwing in your bin just pick one thing maybe you notice your bin has like 50 percent the same item in it yeah something (laughs) disposable that you're always putting in there yeah maybe you're addicted to kitchen roll or something like that yeah just start to think okay did I really need to use that and if I did need to use it is there a better version of that Mm -hmm. I think a lot of kitchen roll for example you could actually just throw it in your food waste and it will biodegrade there sometimes even things that claim to be biodegradable if you're putting it in your normal bin and then it goes to a landfill. Landfills are eventually sealed yeah. and no decomposing can happen because mm-hmm. there's no air and light in there. Also, that's the thing when you see products that are somewhat arbitrarily labeled as biodegradable mm. and you just think, well, how do they know that? Yes. Because <laughs> <laughs> because some of them would degrade over like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. And it's like, have you done tests yeah. on these things? Have you been around for 500 years to see if this happens? So, you know, there's that kind of labeling to perhaps mm. tick that box or whatever. But in reality, is it actually a thing? I think one concept that really hit me was that 
every bit of standard plastic that has been made ever is still on the planet. That's really frightening, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Lots of plastic things have been invented in order to, you know, save the paper from like all the trees being cut down. And But yeah, often I think things that we see as a solution to something, they are then a problem in themselves if we don't think through the solution 100%. Did you see that Morrisons now are bringing back the paper bag? Are they? Yeah, I saw this on the news yesterday. Nice. So they're <laughs> now getting rid of the plastic bag for life Yeah, that you're supposed to use several, okay. several times because a lot of them are just getting thrown away. Yeah. So instead now they've introduced paper bags, which are mm. meant to be really strong. Okay. I, I don't know if they're made out of recycled paper. I would hope so. Something I found when I was doing my July challenge on the blog, which... I wrote one step a day in July for how you could cut down your waste. One thing I learned was that there's very little what we'd call virgin paper nowadays. Mm -hmm. They learned to recycle paper, I think, something like 2,000 years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But there's a fact, something like if you were to use a plastic bag and then choose to use a, a paper one instead, you need to use that paper bag at least three times for it to be worth the energy that's made it compared to the plastic bag and then a cotton bag is like 131 times you need to use it (laughs) yep um yeah and then people fall into the danger of getting of just accumulating millions of cotton bags yes and then you only need one or two or like if you're doing a big supermarket shop maybe five or something which you just keep in your car but then every function you go to or convention or something and you get handed a tote bag and you just think well, this is great. What am I going to do with this? Mm -hmm. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Make it into a mask. It's always an option to say no to that bag. I know there's the argument that, oh, if it's already been made, you might as well take it. But if you're taking it, you're giving them the signal that you really enjoy that you get that bag when you go to that event. (laughs) Well, better make more. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So if they end that event and find that, oh, we only actually gave out 50 bags instead of the 100 that we'd ordered. Yeah. You know, they might might order fewer for the next event. Yeah, that raises a really interesting point, doesn't it? Because customer feedback is mm. super important, isn't it? Yes. And I know one thing that you're quite big on is writing to companies mm. to become aware and tell them about things that could be done better. Yeah. What are some companies that you would recommend supporting? I think it's always a good idea to do a little bit of local research, and that might sound like a lot of work, but all you need to do is join a local Facebook group. Yeah, and we all have the time now. So. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> My area, we've got the Waltham Forest Ethical and Sustainability Group or something like that. It's not quite the name, but <laughs> I found out about a local soap shop, for example, that runs out of a local industrial estate. Mm. And it's just such a nice feeling to you know, go in there and say hello to the same faces all the time and you know I'm able to spread the word about them on Facebook and they're doing really well they've started branching out into other products as well yeah getting to know your local people is a really good thing always reach out to the companies because it is so easy Mm -hmm. there really is no reason why we shouldn't yeah when you're unpacking your shopping and you notice that something has got a plastic tag on it or something that it doesn't need to have Mm. take out your phone and I'm not suggesting take a photo of it put it on Facebook and shame the company (laughs) because no one's going to make any friends like that but you know send them a message and say I really get a lot of value out of your product I'm trying to lower my own waste at the moment and Mm. I'm wondering if I need to switch to a different company if I want to eradicate the waste that I'm getting from your product. And I think it's always good once you've started going down that path to offer them alternatives as well, because they might not have sat down and thought about it. Yeah. And they Um, do have like specialized PR people employed to deal with those sorts of things, you know, and how do they know what to deal with in their job if they don't get that feedback, Mm. if they don't get people writing in. I've heard something like all they need is five to ten people to message in with the same thing and they will put resources into tackling it, even the big companies. Mm -hmm. I heard something interesting today about Brewdog, Mm. the brewery up in Scotland, and they are now using cans that would otherwise go to waste. 
So cans that get made because of surplus or they've made a, a wrong order or because of excess in labeling or something, mm. they don't get filled with beer and then they just get thrown away. So now BrewDog are taking those and they're relabeling them yeah. and putting their own beer in That's them. That's brilliant. Because BrewDog are huge now. Yeah. I guess they were a bit of a grassroots brewery back in the day, but they're yeah. they're massive. I think it's so easy for companies to just follow the mold that all the other companies like them have followed before. Yeah. And all it takes is a kind word from a few of their consumers saying, hmm, I'm not sure that you're doing this in the best way. Yeah. And they will start to question the way they're doing things. Yeah. And then if they see other companies following the sort of feedback that they've gotten, then it gives them a, a new mold yeah. to follow. So in terms of tips also, because obviously your blog is from a musician's point of view, mm. much like the how this podcast is <laughs> from a musician's point of view. But what sort of things would you suggest pertaining to musicians, what we can do to be a bit more conscious and sustainability in yeah. what we do? As a whole, I think orchestral musicians, from what I've seen, we're not so bad at the whole sustainability side of things. If you think about it, most string players will buy a second-hand instrument or third-hand or fourth-hand. That's you true, know, they yeah. They could be hundreds of years old. <laughs> that um, cello's not going to landfill anytime soon. <laughs> exactly. We really care for our instruments once we have them in our possession. I mean, some people enjoy collecting instruments, but generally we have one or two that we really look after. We don't throw it away when it's broken. We take it to the mender. Yes, I mean, when I hear of a student who wants to upgrade their instrument and get a new one, maybe they've got to a higher grade and the instrument they've got isn't serving them very well. I always think, is there another student that I've got who might be able to make use of their instrument that they're getting rid of? Yeah. Or have I got any friends that I've seen advertising that they're selling an instrument on Facebook? Yeah. And very often there is. It's yeah. amazing once you start putting the feelers out, because I've definitely had this happen. I had one student grow out of her one eighth size cello. Aww. It was basically a viola. It was so <laughs> small. And needed to upgrade to a quarter size. And then I'd just seen on social media that another cello colleague of mine, her student was getting rid of her quarter size. Mm. And that's just how all this works. Yeah. So that side of things, I think we're quite good but in terms of gigging musicians in the in normal times <laughs> pre-corona times we do a lot of traveling and yeah. i think the more conscious we can be of that the better we shouldn't feel guilty if we have to go to play at a wedding in the middle of nowhere where there's no station anywhere nearby short sure, drive there yeah but for example my husband and i we I think we only got our car about five years ago. We we managed till then. It was starting to get a bit ridiculous that we'd get the train down to our parents in Kent and borrow a car like every other weekend, mm. like towards when we did get our car. So we decided it, it was time to get one. But we have managed to survive with one car between us. Yes. And it's the smallest car we can manage with. We haven't just gone, oh, what's... What's the most fashionable car to get at the moment, you know? <laughs> what type of car do you have? Uh, we have a little red Hyundai i10. We call it our little red dragon. It is. <laughs> <laughs> it's much loved. <laughs> right. But we've tried to coordinate our teaching so that when we're driving down to Kent, which is where we're both from and we both teach there, we try and do our teaching on the same day. So mm. we're sharing the car. Yeah. You know, you can always ask your orchestra manager for a list of the other players doing the gig and yeah. you can not only share a lift and save some petrol money but you can also have a nice you know day out nice yeah, road trip with yeah. a friend that's really really useful isn't it asking for the player list to share lifts yeah because well sometimes it's just a nice opportunity to spend time in the car with your friend yeah. if you know that they're on the gig with you but also it just you know you can split the costs and yeah that person can keep you awake if you're driving home in the middle of the yeah. night <laughs> and like never be afraid if you've got another half that's a musician to ask the orchestra manager you don't happen to need another trumpet yeah. player do you or you know <laughs> this is yeah. ticking the box of spending time with the people who mean the most to you whilst also yeah working so do you find yourselves come in a package deal sometimes violin and trumpet sometimes yeah yeah S sometimes we're a little bit of a lower string package yeah it's cello we need a double bass as well oh <laughs> here's mark <laughs> Yeah, yep. that's good. But also try not to like start your gig day just in a fog of, oh, I've just got to get out of the house. Stop and think, 
what's my day going to look like? Is there going to be a chance to go and get a cup of tea? Okay, I'll take a reusable cup with me. You'll get a discount yeah, at most yeah, yeah. shops, Funny at thing most is, cafes. I had a really hard time finding my reusable coffee cup last yeah. week because I, weirdly Hadn't enough, used it for yeah, a long time. <laughs> weirdly enough, had a gig last week. I was up really early and I was like, great, get a coffee. Where on earth is my coffee cup? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah absolutely. To definitely move to the back of the cup. <laughs> <laughs> or like take a flask of tea with you, then you don't even have to go on that mad dash out in your 15 minutes. Have yeah. I got time to actually go to a coffee shop and queue yeah. up? Yeah, bring your own soy milk in your own flask, as you did today. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Very impressed. I mean, I think that's one thing that musicians do create a lot of waste in, in that department is all the takeaway food containers. How easy is it in your break to go off to M&S and like mm -hmm. get a sandwich, which comes in cardboard, but also has that plastic window as well yeah. and all those salad boxes and stuff yeah. like that. But we are creative people. One of the things I've enjoyed the most about this journey, because it has just been really enjoyable, is coming up with new ways to do things. I think we're used to also not fitting the mould. <laughs> You know, we will all have been teased slightly for having an instrument on our backs in, in the school playground. <laughs> oh, at I some still point, do. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Instead of going to the place that has the plastic wrapped sandwiches, go and support a local business that's got a deli counter mm. and take an empty Tupperware with you or something like that. Yeah. And just say, would you mind putting it in here? Mm -hmm. You're saving them the money of having to provide you with the whatever packaging they're going to put it in as well. Yeah. That's a really good idea. And bringing your own cutlery as well, yes. because it's really easy to accumulate those plastic forks. I mean, a lot of them are now that sort of wooden bamboo mm. stuff, but even so, yeah. you can just bring your own yeah. cutlery. A lot of this compostable plastic, in inverted commas, <laughs> is the same thing with the landfills. Like, unless you're actually putting it in a specific bin that is for biodegradable plastic it's not going to be put in the right condition for it to biodegrade. Yeah, sure. It's just going to end up in the bin with all the other stuff in the landfill, taking up all this space that we are running out of. Oh my goodness. Even if you haven't gone out and bought fancy, fashionable, reusable cutlery, just grab a tea towel, grab the cutlery you're going to need, wrap it up, put an elastic band around it, shove it in your bag. Yeah. That's all you need. And then like... you can wash it and you've got the tea towel at hand to dry it later. Yep. Yeah, Amazing. I always have a cloth napkin with me because you never know when you're going to spill your tea, mm -hmm. when you're going to have messy fingers from sandwiches yeah, and maybe not have time to run to wash your hands beforehand yeah. before and, you're playing. Again. And I don't know about you, but I seem to have accumulated loads of tea towels, mm. maybe a little bit like the tote bags yeah. we were talking about earlier, but tea towels seem to be one of those gifts that are very easy to give yes. and very easy to receive. Yeah. So I need to find a way to put them to yeah. good use. My first sewing machine experience a couple of years ago, I went round to a friend's house to borrow her sewing machine because I don't have one of my own yet. I just cut an old tea towel down the middle and hemmed it. And now I've got two reusable napkins oh. to take with me. <laughs> it's just so easy using the things that you already have that yeah. aren't being used mm -hmm. at the moment. It's that creative side that I think a lot of us creative types can really get a lot out of. We have the ability to we just need to channel it in the right direction yeah i made my own watering can a few weeks ago i was ah. going to text you about it but i thought <laughs> i'd just tell you now <laughs> it was just from an old schweppes tonic water bottle yeah because goodness knows we've been drinking a lot of gin recently <laughs> but i just drilled some holes mm. in the lid and it was really fun because I got to use the drill with yes. the thinnest <laughs> drill bit. And I just, whoop, 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 whoop. and it's brilliant because then I can water my flowers in the front there yeah. with a spray setting. So proud of you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. And I also use those as little plastic cloches to cover seedlings. Okay. Yeah. So that's good. Very good. Into your gardening. Yeah. <laughs> as you mentioned, it's just being creative and finding ways to reuse yeah. these things isn't it? if you can avoid buying things or even just hold off on it for a little bit you are so likely to find something in your house that will do the job just as well or you might even end up chatting to someone about the fact that you're intending to buy something and find out that they already own one and they're not using it so yeah. they might be able to pass it on to you mm, yeah totally so what do you think about what musicians can do in terms of you know having instruments yeah. for example 
the bows that we use on stringed instruments made from very, very rare type of wood, Pernambuco yep. wood, which I think is from Brazil. Yes. Yeah. And that's a resource which is running out. Things like that. But also, you know, what do you do with things like old strings yeah. and horse hair? How do you feel about horse hair if you're someone that <laughs> doesn't like using that kind of thing? Yeah. I think it's a very tricky question. We are in an industry where things have been done a certain way for a very long time. And you may even be looked down upon for doing things slightly differently. Mm. Pernambuco has been chosen for bow making because... The properties are just spot on for it. Its grain is just right. It can be uh, molded into the right shape at heat and then it stays in that shape afterwards. It's got just the right amount of strength and flexibility for bows. Hmm. It is terrible that the wood is running out. But now people are actually trying to save the wood and try and grow more of it again. Yeah. It is protected. Well, that's good that they're growing yeah. more. I didn't realise that. There's an organisation in America called the International Pernambuco Conservation Initiative. Catchy. Um, yeah. So I think a lot of bow makers, they will be aware of this. Yeah. I get the impression that instrument makers and bow makers, they care so much about their craft they don't want their resources to run out. So yeah. if there is a way that they can still obtain brilliant quality wood, but in a sustainable way in conjunction with organisations like this, I think there's another similar thing in Canada as well, that they're um, helping to source it sustainably. Just as with anything, if your resources are running out, you need to protect them. Slow down the production and also try to boost the growing of these trees again. I guess it also sort of goes back to what you said before about musicians being quite good at buying secondhand mm. things. And, you know, a lot of the time we do buy a bow, it is a secondhand yeah. bow. And just making sure that maybe you don't necessarily need to have a new bow made for you. Yeah. Maybe your perfect bow exists already. Yes. Like a wand. <laughs> <laughs> It's so much like a wand. <laughs> it is, isn't it? It's a yeah. weird thing to explain to someone about mm. how personal a bow yeah. is, especially to a non-musician mm. or even someone who is a musician but not a string player. Yeah. It's very, very personal. But if you only need one bow and a spare, don't make it your life mission to buy 15 Pernambuco bows. <laughs> you know, some people are in Baroque performance and they do need lots of different types of bow. But oh. as with anything, again, just buy what you need. Yeah. And go to a museum and look at the beautiful bows there. You know, you can't try them out unless you're that person with that specific job of trying out the instruments in the museum. Yeah. They are works of art that we're playing with. Yeah, totally. I think it's just very easy to have things and mm. accumulate things, as I mentioned before with the microphones. Yes. <laughs> you know, and if you are like a massive bow enthusiast and you have this amazing bow that was made by this amazing bow maker, and then the opportunity may be presented to you that you acquire mm. another one by another amazing bow maker, and yep. then all of a sudden you've got 20. And mm. But then it's just taking a step back sometimes and thinking, yeah. do I need this? And if you are having something made, Again, talk to the maker about it. Find out what their practices are, whether they're supporting companies that are sourcing the materials responsibly. If they're not already doing it, that might just waken up that part of their consciousness that yeah. they need to start doing that. Because like it or not, we are running out of resources and people are becoming more aware of it. So m more people are going to be putting pressure on companies and artisan makers. It's that feedback again yeah. that we were talking about. Yeah. So two quick questions. Mm. What would you do with old strings? Because yes. I know as a violinist, you guys burn through strings a lot <laughs> faster than we do on the cello. Part of the reason for that is that cello strings are just so expensive. I can't afford to replace them every six months. You but know, they're thicker as well, aren't they? So they, possibly that helps them last Yeah. Longer. Well, to be honest, I've not really been playing my cello that <laughs> much recently. It's not like that it's been getting that much use. But that's true. You shouldn't really need to change your C string that often because... Mm. It should last you. So expensive. I did a gig with Opera North once when the cellist who was playing the rest the in the recitatives, their C string snapped oh. so loudly about a page before the end. <laughs> and it was amazing just seeing like the number two cellist switch cellos with them so yeah. quickly 
that's the sound that you don't want to hear every now and then, very um wow. very regularly <laughs> so strings I'll admit I need to change my strings but I just feel like it's not worth it because I'm not playing my violin <laughs> yeah. to anyone at the moment yeah. this is how I feel about getting a bow re here I'm like oh I really need a bow re here yeah. but then I think well why do yes. I really <laughs> So one thing that I do, I teach in a school in East London, teaching secondary school girls one-to-one violin lessons. And a lot of them come from families that don't have very much spare income. And if, like a couple of times when I've needed to change string while I'm at school, I'll just give my old string to one of my students. Because no matter how tired the string is sounding to my (laughs) ears... It's going to be a whole lot better than the very, very cheap string that yeah. probably their violin arrived from <laughs> Amazon with. Yeah, yeah, the cheese wire strings. <laughs> it's amazing how much you can boost the sound of like a stentor violin if it's got a really good quality but old lower string on it. Yeah, that's a really good point, actually. Donate your strings. Yeah. Yeah. So that's still. one thing that I do. I have heard that in the States... TerraCycle have got a string recycling scheme. When I found out about that recently, I sent the link to my friend who runs a music school in um, America because I thought, oh, yay, they could have a recycling box in their music school. (laughs) But unfortunately, there aren't any in the UK. So I am thinking about maybe getting in touch with TerraCycle and, you know, saying, you have this scheme in America. Could you have it in the UK as well? I can contact all the music shops Mm -hmm. and ask because my flat is very small. I don't have room for a string collection (laughs) box in my flat. As you said before, you only need five to ten people to write in. I'll be one of them. (laughs) Yay! I'll send you a template. Yeah, all right, right. And then I'll send that on to four (laughs) friends. But yeah, it would be really good to get some collection boxes in the main music shops in London and yeah. if there are any other chains of music shop around. Because I think that's one thing that's quite daunting for especially parents of young students who are presented with broken strings mm-hmm. and then they just think, oh, which string should I buy? They're so expensive. But if they have a slightly more accessible way of getting strings, then mm-hmm. it's probably going to be a bit more encouraging both for them and the student. Yeah. So horse hair. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> have you tried vegan horse hair? I haven't, no. actually. Have uh, you? No, I haven't. Because I... you are vegetarian, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. But I've just heard about some people who are starting to experiment with vegan horse hair. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's an interesting concept. I mean, this is another one of those questions that there just doesn't seem to be a right answer. Because if you're not using horse hair, what are you using? And is yeah. it going to biodegrade ever? That's the thing, isn't it? You know, you have the natural thing, which may be resources are either running out or can be hard to come by or may incur animal suffering. Not Mm. that it does for horse hair, I don't think. I don't think so. It's just a haircut. I heard once that because they need their tails to like swat away flies, Mm. sometimes they give them hair extensions on their tails. (laughs) (laughs) But again, like what's their hair extension made out of? Yeah, yeah, true. Is that then going to be around in the world forever? Yeah. Maybe they use it the next time they cut the horse's tail, I don't know. Yeah, that's the thing. Sometimes, as you mentioned before, you have a new product that's supposed to pose a solution Mm. to a problem, but then ends up creating another problem further down the line. I think this kind of links to the question of whether you jump right in or whether you change things slowly. Mm. If you change things slowly, you've got time to think about it. Think about whether you actually need the product first or whether you've just seen, oh, my desk partner had a really nice reusable coffee cup. I'm just going to forget about the one I already have and go and buy that, (laughs) go and buy their one. Even though I've got 20 already. (laughs) Yeah. So yeah, always ask, are you going to actually use the product? Because if you've gone on Instagram and seen someone who claims to be zero waste and seen that the past month's worth of photos are all things you don't own and you just go out and buy them all, (laughs) the energy that's gone into making those products is going to be completely wasted if you are just buying them so that you can tick a box that you've Mm. got that item in your zero waste kit. Yeah. And then I suppose it goes back to thinking about each of those individual items having its life cycle as Mm. well and how before it's time with you, yeah. At that time being manufactured or whatever, on maybe mm. on the other side of the world, maybe incurring a massive carbon footprint on its way over to you. Yeah. Not to mention what happens when you're done with your 20 keep cups and what yes. you're going to do with them all afterwards. We need to be mindful as well. If we do realize that 
we don't need all the stuff that we've got in our houses. Don't just get rid of it immediately. Like sit down and think, is there someone else that I know that might need this item? Mm -hmm. I can stop them having to go and buy a new version of it. And I can stop mine just going to waste. There are so many different places that will be over the moon to take in your items that you're not using anymore. You know, charity shops is one obvious a solution that's been yeah. around for ages but there's loads of sharing apps around now yeah. and free cycle free cycle yeah. yeah actually the couch you're sitting on now is our friend's old couch oh i had to move out of the country because of coronavirus yeah which was super sad because their really work sad. dried up and so they moved overseas mm. and they said hey you guys just moved into an unfurnished flat. You've been talking a lot about how you've been sitting on the floor and on beanbags. Would you like a couch? <laughs> so but obviously. hey, that's brilliant. You didn't go straight out and buy yeah. a sofa. Yeah. Especially like so many people go out and buy things because they feel they have to have them in their house now when they don't have the money to buy it and they have to go into debt to buy it. That's a big problem yeah. as well. And also sometimes it's very tempting to buy something new because I'm of that demographic on social media where I'm just constantly getting ads from certain furniture <clears> websites <throat> and you can just think, oh, that's a nice looking sofa. Yeah, there's a crazy <laughs> fact that unfortunately comes from the States so it doesn't apply directly to us. But it's from seven years ago, so maybe it does, that the average American was seeing 5,000 ads a day. <gasps> oh, that's horrendous. And ads are designed to make you feel like you're lacking something in your life. Yeah. If you're sitting there thinking, that's complete rubbish, I'm not seeing 5,000 ads a day. Maybe not at the moment because we're in lockdown, <laughs> sort of, still. You know, walk past the shop. There will be ads in the window for yeah. things you should go into the shop and buy. You know, listen to the radio. How many adverts were on the radio? Oh, yeah, totally, yeah. Just stop and ask yourself some questions before giving people your money. Yeah. For well, things that you don't know where they came from. It goes back to what you said right at the very beginning, which is just be aware. So going back to your blog, Eco Notes, what sparked it all for you? Oddly enough, something that in your head wouldn't equate to low-waste living. Probably finding Marie Kondo's book... <laughs> You might have heard of it. The life-changing magic of tidying up. I don't feel like I was necessarily a maximalist before, but I definitely had a lot of junk in my house that I didn't need to have. And as soon as you start decluttering, you start getting all these things in your head like, why did I buy this stuff in the first place? Why did I hang on to this thing for 10 years? And my sister asked me once, how do you live with yourself with all this decluttering that you're throwing so much stuff in your bin when you profess to be a low waste advocate? I think you just kind of have to accept the fact that you did buy all this rubbish and use that as leverage to teach yourself that you don't need to buy it in the first place. So in a way it's clearing that slate yeah. and then starting anew when you go forth Yeah, from that. I think that is where I started questioning things before I bought them because I didn't want to have to declutter them again. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, just out of necessity. Yeah. I don't want to tidy up again, so I'm just not going to have stuff. <laughs> exactly. And I mean, it frees up so much of your time as well that you're mm. not having to dust 10,000 items in your house when you're doing the cleaning. And also it just gives you a bit more space. It really prompted me to think about like where all the stuff had come from in the first place. I would definitely... After you've started checking what's in your bin and thinking about what you could not be throwing away, start to look around you as well and see what stuff in your house is just serving you no purpose at all. It may even be stressing you out because you can yeah. see it in the corner of your eye. Because everyone's got that pile of miscellaneous yes. stuff where they're like, oh, I should get round to doing that one day. Yet somehow lockdown during a global pandemic is not enough to get you yeah. to go through that box. Yeah, we all feel like oh, when I'm a bit older, I'll upsize to a bigger house because I need more room. A lot of the time, that's just because you've accumulated even more stuff. Pare down your possessions. You don't need a double garage instead of a single garage to store all your stuff in. Yeah. You can save money on the house that you're buying because it doesn't need to be so big. You can save money on your energy bills. That's very good for the environment as yeah. well. Definitely look at your stuff around you as well. So definitely reducing mm, and yes. reusing. Yes. I actually personally haven't read any of Marie Kondo's stuff. Oh. But I know all about it because it's been in the public eye a lot. I will admit that she does come across as a bit of 
a loopy person. <laughs> like, <laughs> I don't know how well I'd get on with her. <laughs> like, personally. Personally. If you met her, would you just be like, yeah. what's with you? But the philosophy behind it all is just so obvious once you re- you read it. When I first read the book, I'm just sitting there thinking, well, obviously, that's what's draining so much of my energy. That's why I never feel like my house is clean. <laughs> that's why I never feel like I have time to do the things that I want to do like to do enough practice or to answer all the emails I have in my inbox because decluttering goes into that sort of stuff as well you know if you've got a thousand unread emails in your inbox it is going to be weighing on your mind whether you know it or not (laughs) I can't have that I can't have that I do see some people's devices and, and phones where they've got like 20,000 unread emails yeah. and I'm like no even if I don't read it just clear it yes <laughs> clear it or unsubscribe from those emails Absolutely. that you don't read well these are some of those advertisements that we're seeing all the time <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what happens all the time like when you see offers from restaurants or whatever yeah the same things like oh two for one or whatever yeah I just think hmm haven't had a pizza from there in a while <laughs> maybe tonight's the night <laughs> <laughs> So, as you may or may not know, in my podcast, I have a segment called the Wild Card Question Round. Yes, I do know. <laughs> How does that make you feel? A little bit scared. <laughs> oh, don't be scared. But this is what I tell everybody. <laughs> so, anyway, I decided to call your Wild Card Question Round the what version, because they all start with the word what. Okay. This is your opportunity to choose what I ask you next based on three choices. And they are, <gasps> what's in your case... What's for dinner? And what are you practicing? Okay. Let's go with what are you practicing? All right. So what are you currently practicing at the moment? First of all, on the violin. And second of all, on the mandolin. Well, on the mandolin, I am practicing grade one mandolin pieces. (laughs) (laughs) Party time. (laughs) Yes. We've been saying like, yes, we've not been earning much in lockdown, but we've actually saved a lot of money. But I've recently just gone on a bit of a mandolin music splurge. (laughs) Are you accumulating more mandolin (laughs) paraphernalia? (laughs) I've downloaded a syllabus for mandolin grades. And yeah, I'm trying to buy a good selection of books whilst not buying all of them. (laughs) It's quite good, actually. On the eco side of things, there are a lot of PDF versions of books available. Online resources. Yeah, Yeah, especially from their kind of more independent publishers for the mandolin repertoire i think i've taken delivery of about six different books in the last two weeks so i did start by playing some of the grade one violin pieces which were good grade one on on the mandolin oh okay so violin music on on the mandolin Mandolin. yeah Yeah. which worked really well actually and my first couple of videos that i've shared were playing violin pieces (laughs) Mm -hmm. yeah it's been really nice seeing i actually think the grade one mandolin pieces stretch you more than the grade one violin pieces would stretch a beginner violinist okay in what way i feel like i've learned a few more techniques like there are harmonics in them for example really and i know some beginner violin methods do bring in harmonics very early and i think that is a good idea but it seems to be much more standard but is it because you know mandolin Mm. I mean, I don't know enough about the instrument, but <laughs> you don't have to wield a bow. You don't. Do you know and the, that's a the big number thing. of times this week I've gone to put my mandolin away and thought, where's my bow? <laughs> am, am I going to shut my case without my bow in it? Oh, wait, there's a plectrum instead. Plectrum, yeah, yeah, yeah. Where's my plectrum? <laughs> <laughs> oh, also, you have to obviously start to play chords a bit earlier. Oh, sure, yeah. Yeah, I think. On the violin, double stopping when you start introducing it, everyone's like, oh my goodness, Uh, how am I going to do that? Yeah, and it always sounds awful at first, doesn't it? Because I just (laughs) press too hard. Often, yes. (laughs) I always feel, though, it is in my best interest as a violin teacher to get the best sound out of my students as early as possible. So I try and encourage them to not just press down to get both strings. It's all about angle. Mm -hmm. It's not angle, yep. It's not about pressure. And flat bow here. Yes. Trying to do a double stop with the wood of the bow on the string. Yeah. It's like, no, it's not going to work like that, is it? <laughs> you heard that. That didn't work. So what have you been practicing on the violin? On the violin, as mentioned earlier, I've actually been just playing through a lot of my wedding music for gigs. I've collected so many arrangements over the past that 
I've either been scared of picking in a gig because I wasn't sure if the arrangement worked properly because I just found it somewhere online, you know. I've actually been doing some recording just for myself of me playing the violin part and then play along with it on viola because I can, because I'm doing my trio pads at the moment. And then playing the cello part on the viola as well. (laughs) It's a good bit of a... (laughs) Wow, that's a brain workout. Mental work, yeah. Yeah. But I feel... I'm in a good position for like transposing at sight because I used to play at my parents' church with a guitarist who would frequently forget to take his capo off. Oh! So he'd be like playing the introduction <laughs> and I'd realise halfway through, the finger I've got my note on ready to start is not the right oh, note. Oh no! <laughs> That's not fair. But good it for you. It wasn't fair. Yeah, but you developed a feel, new skill yeah. out of that. Yeah, Sam's always pleasantly surprised at my transposing at sight yeah it's obviously trumpeters have to do it all the time of course yeah because as string players we don't do that often Mm. I came to a realization a few years ago when I was doing a bit of teaching work coaching in a very young orchestra yeah and so I'd kind of have to coach not only the cello students but just whoever was sort of flailing at the time turns (laughs) out there were quite a lot of them so you never knew who you would be playing along with Mm. and sometimes you'd find yourself faced with a trumpet part or a clarinet part which in B flat but discovered a handy little trick if you're a cellist and you're in that position you're reading something in B flat mm. just pretend what is on their page is written in tenor clef uh-huh. and then it just works wonderful I don't really know why <laughs> but it just does once you've spent a second to just work out the formula you need <laughs> yeah exactly. it's okay <laughs> yeah yeah and then just try not to think too much about it because you get all bogged down Brilliant. So thanks so much for joining me on the podcast. And it's really, really nice. I just really have to highlight how good it is to speak face to face. So thank you. Thank for you so much joining for me, me here. So where can people find your blog and find out a little bit more about your work? Well, the website is econotes.co.uk. I've also got a Facebook page, which is Lucia's Econotes. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much once again. Thank you. That was Lucia Devanzo Lewis. It was great to catch up with her in person. I'm grateful that she drove all the way to my place for a chat with her takeaway flask of soy milk in tow for her cup of tea. She's an inspiration. As she mentioned in the chat, she organised her wedding music during lockdown, so she brought along her duo pads and her violin, and we played duets. It was a lovely way to spend the afternoon, and I'm pleased to say that she's got some really great violin and cello duet arrangements, so you can book her ensemble, Astley Strings, for weddings and events, and make sure you have someone there to tell the musicians when to stop playing. This week's Music College Didn't Prepare Me segment comes from violinist Minzy Yang from her time in New Zealand. Music College Didn't Prepare Me for back when I was playing with Vector Wellington Orchestra. I was studying at uni as well as playing second violin in a season of La Traviata. In one of the performances during an uncha-cha moment, I was so tired because I'd been studying all day at uni that I fell asleep while playing. My desk partner noticed and poked me on my knee. I woke up with a jump and my bow fell and I got the death stare from the conductor. It resulted in many apologies from me to the manager and the conductor, but at the same time, I learnt that I need to make sure to schedule my day well and always have enough energy to go to work. And maybe that's why I play way more first violin these days. Thank you, Minzy, for your contribution and for sharing the lesson that you learnt. I can't say I've ever fallen asleep during a performance, but I've come close, especially when there's dim lighting involved. Remember, if you have a gig, anecdote, or experience that Music College didn't prepare you for, let me know. Email me at asitcomespodcast at gmail.com. And remember, submissions can be anonymous. That's it for today. Special thanks to Ros Nagy for my logo and Daniel Alms for my jingle. Planet-sized thanks to Lucia for the wonderful chat and sharing her tips and experiences on living a low-waste lifestyle. And as always, thank you for listening. Get in touch at asitcomespodcast at gmail.com. Like and follow the podcast on Facebook and Instagram at asitcomespod. 
Remember to rate, review and subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. And thank you for continuing to spread the word. Chat to you soon. Bye. Thank you.